Okay, fellas, it's uh, 10 minutes after we were supposed to start here, so I think we're ready. Um, hello again, Zach Osborne, Chief Fire Department here in Butte. Um, Greg Meegard asked me to step in for him. He had to leave, so I'm introducing our next speaker. Courage under fire leadership, 10 commandments of the great fire service professional. Uh, Deputy Chief from Santa Clara, California, uh, County Fire Department. Steve P. I'm not going to butcher his last name. He'll, he'll let you know. I will okay. agree with that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Welcome, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to get up to Montana for the first time actually speaking. I've been up here about 15 years ago with my wife traveling, but just beautiful country up here. So without boring you, because we got a lot of stuff to cover in a short amount of time. I don't have exciting topics to talk about, like 4096, and I sat through the last conversation on that. We could have a whole other discussion on that, as we call it, the 9648 in California, because most of the time, people end up getting forced for the half their four days, so that's a whole long story. But anyway, my topic I want to cover that I'm fortunate to be here for um, is 10 Commandments of a Great Fire Service Professional. And I say professional because all of us are professionals. Let me get a quick lay of the land of how many in the room um, are from volunteer agencies? Probably most of you okay. How about career agencies? Any others I missed? How about for rank structure? Chief officers? Okay. Company officers? Firefighters? Engineers? Or both? Okay. Now, all of us have leadership potential. I think that's something that some people only point to the chiefs or the captains about. Well, I'm just a firefighter. I'm an engineer. I'm not a leader. You are a leader. You know, if you really think about all of us as human beings have leadership potential, and that's going to be my challenge to all of you. So I talk about a topic, Courage Under Fire Leadership, that's near and near to my heart. Why I call it Courage Under Fire Leadership is because I think it takes courage to be a leader in today's world, seriously. Not just in the fire service, but in the entire world. Any of you want to be, say, the President of the United States, or a governor, or a mayor, or a city council member? Maybe some of you have done that stuff, and my hat's off to you. Hey, anyone want to be maybe like the CDC director, or a public health director, say, about two years ago? Uh, no thank you. I mean, that. whether you agree or disagree, it takes courage to make decisions, and that's what I want to talk about today, and I'll build upon tomorrow when I do the closing keynote uh, in the morning, which I'm honored to do as well. So, just a little bit about myself here. Just a little bit about myself. Been in the fire service about 30 years, starting out like probably most of you, you know, Explorer Scout for a little bit in the city of Alameda, student firefighter with the Oakland Fire Department part-time paid call firefighter for four bucks an hour, minimum wage back in the early 90s, but you know what, it was experience, it was some money, good benefits, can't complain, but hey, we all got to start somewhere. Then I spent, got hired in Santa Clara County in 1995, spent 26 and a half years there, recently retiring as a deputy chief. So I was fortunate to spend about five years as a firefighter, about five as a captain, about five as a battalion chief, and the last ten as deputy chief, give or take. So. A lot of great things I've been involved with. I'm still involved with a lot of things, teaching at the community college, um, Chabot College in Hayward, um, teaching the intro to fire class, contract instructor with the National Fire Academy, as well as contributing editor with Fire in House Magazine, and author of five different books, um, which really excited that Fire Enduring is also publishing my next book, Encourage Under Fire Leadership, hopefully out next year. But enough about me. Feel free to grab my cards at the end. I'll share my contact information at the end, but for anyone that is looking for training suggestions, leadership suggestions, and I'm not just the guy from California telling you what to do, I think I've got a lot of good information for anybody around the country, so code3firetraining.com is my website, contact information, there's a free stuff link with lots of great free information, suggestions, uh, if you know if anyone wants to be a firefighter, I, like I said, I teach at Chabot College, ChabotFire.com is our website, free stuff link with lots of great resources for anyone around the country wanting to be a firefighter. So a lot of good stuff that I want to share that I just enjoy giving back and paying it forward on. So we could stop right here. I mean, when I talk about Ten Commandments of a great fire service professional, doesn't this cover everything or should? And I know some people say you should add comma right, do your job comma right, because there is some accuracy obviously involved. But when I say do your job, it comes down to stuff like this. Now, as a volunteer firefighter, I know that's got to be extremely challenging. Tell me, tell me if I'm not mistaken there. Challenging when it comes to training, 
you know, I know you may have drill nights or drill days or whatever else, but you don't always respond with the same personnel, do you? I mean, obviously in a smaller department you may, but maybe in larger sized departments, as a company officer, chief officer, it's got to be challenging, right? Because, you know, do you always know what you're going to get all the time when it comes to strengths and weaknesses of folks, you know, or numbers of personnel or whatever else? But especially as a volunteer, when you've got other priorities, family, full-time job, it's tough to actually get out. So one of the biggest challenges that we have is around the country seeing lightweight trust construction, a lot of changes in the building construction industry. I'm assuming most of your new homes are built like this with lightweight trust construction. I mean, obviously there's a lot of old stuff too. I had a chance to drive up to the historic downtown area, a very beautiful area. But, you know, how often do we get into our first two areas, especially the newer folks today? What's one of the biggest complaints about people that we're hiring today? I, it's probably not any different in Montana than it is in California. What do you think the biggest complaints of the younger generations are? And I'm not slamming younger generations because, trust me, 30 years ago they were complaining about the generations. 30 years from now they'll be complaining about them, just all different things. What's some of the biggest complaints about the youngest, younger generations? And I'm not making fun of anybody here. Buried in the phone. I'm sorry, what? Buried in the iPhone. Very, yeah, very in the phone potentially, but let's maybe be a little more specific. How about when it comes to maybe mechanical ability knowledge? Zero. Yeah, well, yeah, we, and I'm mechanically declined, uh, declined, yes. I'll be the first to admit that. My wife's a mechanically inclined one, you know. She's a fire marshal for neighboring county department. She's the one that fixes everything. I'm, I'm not complaining. She loves doing yard work and everything else, but it works. But a lot of the mechanical ability things, we used to hire people from the trades. Is that the same up here where you're, pretty much struggling to find, find people with experience from the trades, let alone just basic skills one-on-one. Well, partly it's not their fault as much as whoever raised them, but we're not going to get into that as much as we could because I think we all have that duty to uh, mentor others. But when it comes to like building construction knowledge, we need to get our folks out there and show them the hazards that are out there that are not just in newer buildings but also older ones. We talk about doing our job. Did we do our job here? And, and I'm not making, I'm going to share some pictures and videos. We're not making fun of any departments. We're not Monday morning quarterbacking anything. We're not critiquing anything. We're trying to make these as lessons learned. And I encourage you to share some of this stuff that you see on social media or the internet with those in your department because there's a good chance members in your department may not be familiar with stuff like Fire and Jury Magazine or, you know, they're aware of the internet obviously and certain things, but exposing them to what's going on out there. Don't rely on your training officer or your fire chief to provide all the training. We need to do that for ourselves and others. So, now, without knowing all the details and everything else, do we have a tendency sometimes to drive fast to get to calls? I've been guilty of that too. It's like, you know, there's people trapped, there's a baby not breathing. Is the baby, is the baby not breathing still? You know, and that's the challenge, because I've been that driver that drives fast. I've been that company officer that's told the driver to slow down a little bit, and then, of course, hey, don't tell me how to drive. I'm the driver. Well, yeah, but I'm the company officer, and we're both going to get in trouble here if something bad happens. And here's a case of we don't make it to the call. God forbid there's any injuries in our end or anything else. How does stuff like this get prevented? Take a second to think. Take a second to think. But what happens when those tones go off? I know you don't fight structure fires every day like we don't either. I mean, the Silicon Valley, where I'm from, around the city of San Jose, we don't fight a lot of fire. Our 15 firehouses, our crews maybe see one working fire every three or four weeks, structure fire. I mean, compared to like FDNY, I couldn't even imagine, Kevin, what you used to see in FDNY years ago. But yeah, 15 firehouses, 66 people on duty, one tone out maybe for a structure fire in the entire department. And it's not always confirmed as a working fire, but at least toned out as a first alarm working fire, maybe once every week if we're lucky. So all ships don't see a lot of fire. So that makes it more challenging. But we live and die by teamwork here. So think about a situation like this. Those tones go off for that occasional fire. It's like assholes and elbows, isn't it? When it's like, oh my God, we got a structure fire. What happens now when you're driving that rig? It's like tunnel vision sets in. And it's so easy for that to happen. I. I mean, not, not to blame anybody, but to me, I blame everybody on that rig. Now, I know in some of your situations, people may drive individually their personal vehicles to the call. I get that. Hopefully, you don't have any accidents for people driving their personal vehicles, or they all haul butt to get to the, you know, the station to have, get on the rig and go and everything else. But 
we need to train our team members better to be able to all look out. I get the drivers probably focusing on the road, wanting to get there. I get the company officers maybe looking at the map book or looking at the iPad or whatever you're using to route you to the calls. And there may be people in the back, depending on your staffing or anything else. Again, I'm not, obviously full-time career agencies have staffing, but also volunteer crews I know may meet at the firehouse. So what else is another way we can prevent stuff like this? Besides good, clear communication with your crew. There's one other way. I mean, knowing your area. Knowing the area, yeah. Try yeah, I mean, we all have overpasses in some capacity, you know, and most of them are all posted at the size limits. Know your, but, uh, I'm sorry, what? I'll just know your heights and stuff. Well, yeah. not just know your area, but know your specs of the rig. When I was brand new driver on day one, I had a company officer who's like, okay, check your gear out. You're driving, you know, go over the rig this afternoon. You know, I'll give you a quiz and stuff. And on the way to the store today, we're going to go drive around the area. I'm like, cool, bring it. He took me out to drive around, left turn, right turn, and stops. You know, let's go on the freeway, let's go up hills. He wanted to test my ability. He got to one of these types of intersections. And I remember looking, going, ah, oh, crap. Because guess what I did not do that morning? Measure the rig. Well, yeah, I didn't measure a rig. And this was before most of our rigs also had it posted in the rig, you know, which if you don't do that, it's probably a smart thing to have it posted. Height, weight, length, and all those final stats. Well, I'm like paralyzed. I'm like, oh, shit. And I had to ask him, I go, can we make it or not? He goes, you're the driver. He goes, open up your binder, and it was a slow street. So we pulled over, he goes, open up your binder. I go, okay, nine feet six, because it was 10.0. I go, nine six, we got six inches to go. He goes, slow down. He goes, what's that nine feet six inches? What's that highest point? I don't know. He goes, get your ass out and look. So I get out there, I go, well, it looks like the deck gun. Okay, well, is there stuff stored around the deck gun? Is it fully seated? Crap. So we made it through, but what do you think I did the next day? Because he also took me by bridges too, bridges that are posted. And after that, it's like crap. What do you think I did the next day? And every time I went to a different rig, check the specs out. So we all have different rigs. What do you think I did as a company officer? Same thing. Not to challenge my folks, but to, I mean, not to not to put not to find them doing the wrong thing, but to try to catch them doing the right thing. Of hey, let's go out and do things like that to find out their strengths and weaknesses. Then you look at a picture like this. Were they? Hauling butt. As far as I know, nobody was killed or injured in this. Some uniforms and some probably underwear had to be changed, I would venture. But you think they were hauling butt. And before you answer that, were they hauling butt? They almost made it. They almost had it there. But I don't know of any rig that's less than eight feet tall. Most were at least eight feet tall. But again, there's the challenge. Now, if you're backward facing seats, literally face backward, the, the firefighters riding backwards can't always obviously see. But if they are facing forward, I know it's tough to look around in many cabs. But again, when you bring new people on the job, are you, I know you're training them. I know you're probably saying, if you see something unsafe, say something, do something. But are you empowering them as well too? And I think that's that challenge we all have to do to not just learn our areas, learn our jobs, but maybe the firefighter in the back needs to be the one that says, hey, slow down a little bit. I don't know if we can make it through that or, you know, whatever else. So, number two, train, your, train like your life and the lives of others depend on it. It's simple. I love this picture that I saw. You know, we've all probably joked about situations like this. Hey, bad board firefighters aren't good at all. Yeah, bad things can happen. We make up good rumors at the firehouse. You know, we make up good stories and everything else. But any of you serve as the training officer of your organization? Okay. I'm assuming you have a dedicated training officer, someone that's assigned, they probably have multiple hats to wear and everything else, but especially if you're a company officer, you can't rely on that training officer to train you and your crew and everything. I mean, hopefully they're pushing out the mandatory stuff, but you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of your crews by getting out there and challenging and evaluating them. Number three, I love a phrase, a friend of mine, Kevin Cohen, <coughs> retired from the San Jose Fire Department, shared this with me, prompting for success, meaning teamwork. We can all make stupid decisions. Every day I probably wake up and make dumb decisions, probably like everybody else. Most of them don't get, and get anybody killed or injured or myself in trouble or anybody else in trouble. But 
how many of you have seen something, something bad that was going to happen, and you sit there and go, well, do I say something? Do I not say something? That's the courage to raise your hand. That's why I call it courage under fire leadership. What's the risk that you take when you raise your hand or open your mouth, even in a respectful, tactful way to somebody, even from the back of the cab to prompt for success? Hey, slow down, Rick. Um, we're coming up to a, you know, whatever, blind intersection. You may want to slow down a little bit. What's the risk that you take when you say something like that? Whether you're the junior firefighter in the back of the rig that's got one day on the job, or even when you're the company officer looking at the driver saying, hey, I slow down a little bit, respectfully, tactfully. What's the risk that you take then? See something, say something, do something. That's what we preach, right? Don't we teach that in our academies when we bring people on? It's unsafe, say something. Yeah, it all sounds great, doesn't it? What happens when you do say that, usually? Do, is the normal response, I mean, think about this. Driving down the road with your significant other. You've all done it in some capacity. Hey, slow down a little bit. There's a cop up here, usually. Is that usually met with a, thank you, dear, I appreciate that? No. Yeah, how many arguments have usually started just in a car from something simple as that? And were they doing it to jam you up? Maybe. But what do we now do? Instead of thanking them, we call them a nag, we call them whatever else, don't tell me how to drive, don't be a backseat driver. All they're doing is trying to do what? Help you. Well, help them too, because maybe they don't want the delay, they don't want the, the money spent on tickets or whatever else. That's prompting for success. I'm assuming most of us have seen this Detroit Fire Department vehicle on the tracks a couple of years ago. If you've never seen the Burn movie, that's just such a sobering look at a big city fire department that's just gone to hell and back. But take a look at this. If you haven't seen it, good training video. That is a ladder company. Well, that was a ladder company. seen the Burn movie? There's actually a new updated version come out. I, our union president bought that for our stations. He was so pissed about hearing how bad the stations were. Excuse me. The oldest station at the time was like maybe 40 years old, so it's not like you, you know Detroit 100 year old firehouses that are falling apart literally and some of the stuff that you see on YouTube videos in Detroit. Our stations are actually pretty good, pretty nice condition. But anyway, the union president made that mandatory watching for all the personnel to make them appreciate how good they have it at County Fire. But during the Burn DVD, there's one segment where the commissioner of Detroit is outside at whatever the shop area or the mechanic shop, and he's basically ripping the crews that are out there, basically saying, you knuckleheads left a million dollar ladder company on the tracks, that was this call right here. And basically now you're out of ladder company and in Detroit, if you paid attention to the Burn DVD, they really didn't have brand new first out, their first out breaks sometimes were like 10, 15, 20 years old and their reserves were even older or non-existent. Meaning when you go into a reserve, there was no reserve for some trucks or engines, meaning the crew is now in a Crown Victoria sedan or detailed and the rig was browned out because they didn't have reserve rigs. But in this case, there's four people on a rig, I'm assuming. Even if there was three people on a rig, even if there's two people on a rig, think about the prompt for success factor. Drivers, we make mistakes every day. Officers, we all make mistakes. But the driver parks this rig on the tracks. Obviously, the officer either saw it or didn't see, didn't see it, didn't say something, we don't know. Firefighter may have gotten out of the back. This could have been the rookie firefighter. Hey, Ralph, um, you know you're parked on the tracks. Don't know. Tell me how to drive, kid. Oh, I'm not, but I don't want to switch into a reserve rig at 3 o'clock in the morning because we just crashed this thing and there's no budget money to buy a new one. And I think that's that crew resource management. If you've never heard that term, crew resource management, CRM, look it up. The aviation industry has followed it for years and there's a lot of things we can do because we live and buy, die by teamwork at the crew level. But again, back to that, hey, slow down, Rick. I was a rookie firefighter. I was taught to see something, say something. My driver's hauling ass down the street. Captain's not saying a single word. I'm the rookie. Six months out of the academy, 30-year driver, 30-year company officer. Hey, Rick, slow down a little bit. The company officer's not saying a single word, so he's condoning the behavior of driving way faster than he should have. Anyway, I'm like, hey, Rick, slow down, dude. I want to go home and actually go on vacation with my wife, you know, tomorrow for next week. That prompt for success 
driver has two options at that point. What can the driver do when he's prompted either by his boss or, God forbid, a subordinate rookie green firefighter? The driver has two options when they're confronted with that nice, tactful, respectful, prompt for success. What are their options? Or ignore it. Yeah, they can ignore it. Or slow down. Or they can slow down. Well, actually, they have three options. They can ignore it, they can slow down, and either acknowledge it or not. I mean, someone just slow down or whatever, or some could say, hey, thanks, dude, I appreciate the heads up. Hey, acknowledge it. I'm going to come back another day to say something to help you out again, brother <coughs> or sister. Or they could do like happened to me. Hey, shut up, rookie. Don't tell me what to do. Now the ball's in the officer's court. What are the officer's choices? Ignore it. Again, ignore it. Or acknowledge it. Or turn the tables on me. For And that's what this captain did. The captain, instead of telling Rick to slow down, the captain goes, hey, shut up, rookie. Yeah, he's been on the job longer than you've been alive, blah, blah, blah. What did that just make me do? I tried to help them out. I tried to throw them a bone. What did that just make me do the next time I see something unsafe? I'm not going to say a single damn thing. Why? I'm not stupid. Why am I going to get jammed up? Well, take a look at significant accidents and injury after action reports, not just in the fire service, but nationwide. And what do you see as commonalities when they, when they interview witnesses? Did you see something bad going to happen? And the answer is usually, no, I didn't. Okay. Or, yes, I did. And the next question is, okay, you saw or you anticipated. What did you say? Well, I didn't say anything at all. Why not? Because, well, because I get yelled at every time that I do raise my hand to try to help them out. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not an idiot. Or, no, I did say something. And you know what? I was told to shut the F up. And guess what? Now you're off the hook. Because in some agencies, you may be on the hook even as a firefighter if they found out that you knew something and you didn't say something about it as a leader. But I'm just a firefighter. We're all leaders. All right, talk about taking ownership and having pride. Taking ownership and having pride in what we do. I mean, Rick Lasky wrote a great book on ownership, um, pride and ownership of the fire service. I hear a lot of people sometimes complain about their, their firehouse situation. We can't always pick our crews. You know, we can't always pick our assignments. It's not always, I mean, yes, we can quit and choose to do that, but we don't always get a chance to maybe pick who we work with or how we work or who we respond with. But we live in a society and a time in the world where it's so divisive and people love to complain. I mean, you touched on technology earlier. I mean, I think there's a lot of good benefits to, and I just use this generically as technology. There's a lot of benefits to it, but it makes it a lot easier for people to moan and groan and complain. I mean, I went to get an iced tea at McDonald's earlier, and they gave me sweet tea. And before you laugh, I hate sweet tea. I like unsweet tea. That's cool. If you like sweet tea, more power to you. You're not a hater. Well, they gave me sweet tea by mistake, and I literally got about a block away, and I, you know, I was like, oh, God, the sugar. Okay. I went back. I was a little pissed because I had to go back. But I, some people would have posted probably on Yelp or wherever else saying, I'm going to give them zero stars because they uh, screwed up my drape order. Don't go this place. Okay, guess what? Stuff happens in life. But we live in that society where everyone wants to, we, wants to complain about things without providing solutions. So when you're the highest ranking person in the room, you never want to be that highest ranking person when things go south, because that's where fingers point. But if you're also the highest ranking person in the room, which could just be a company officer, and there's moaning and groaning about what's going on, you know what? You can either allow it to happen or you can put a stop to it at some point. You know, there's some things that are in your control, some things that are out of your control. You know, I missed the entire conversation that the two chiefs were talking about beforehand, but I know there's a lot of fire service issues out there that are very polarizing that can get a lot of people taking sides of things or sides with administration of why are they sticking it to us or why are they jamming this down our throats. Well, sometimes it's out of their control, but when you start complaining about your own situation, if you, okay, if you can't make it better, leave. But you know what? We all have the ability, even in the junior firefighter, the rookie of all rookies has the ability to make things better, at least with a positive attitude and at least not getting sucked up into the negativity. So, you know, do what you can at your level. You know, I remember coming to work years ago where a crew was complaining about the chief's doing this, the chief's making us do this, the chief's making us do this. And I go, okay, the chief's not making us do this. The chief's boss, who is the Board of Supervisors, is basically threatening his butt to do his job by making us do this. 
And they're like, no, he just needs to tell the bosses to just stick it. I'm like, yeah, that works when you're an at-will employee that's not union represented and has already been told by his bosses, you will do this. I'm not a mind reader, but I can figure out what that means, especially in that position. So he doesn't like it, but he has to do the best he can to sell it and market it, and it is what it is. But as I told the crews, I'm like, guys, I go, we can't have this negativity continue. I go, I and mean, I finally got frustrated. Okay, okay it's like 9 o'clock, 9.30, we're going out to the store. We're going to do a little bit of training on the way to the store. Done with this conversation. Well, this is bullshit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, none of us can do anything about this decision. That's the union president's job, and that's the fire chief's job to deal with this issue. We need to be good to go when the bell goes off for Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And it's like, I know some people don't like to have to be told that, but it's like, you know what, hey, this is what we need to do. I mean, again, that's obviously for career personnel, but for volunteers, same thing too. Make it rock. Now, how well do you get to know your first two area? Now, some of you may laugh at, what the hell is that yellow thing? I mean, I know many of you probably have areas that those are pretty much non-existent. Your hydrants are basically, okay, I'm going to show my California here. I don't mean that in a negative or good or bad way. What do you call your water tenders here? Water tenders or water tankers? Tenders. I don't care what you call them personally. I know in California, I know the UICS Ellis. I don't care. Whatever you call them, you call them. But the big things on wheels with 1,000 to 2,000, 3,000 gallons, I get that. But for those that do have hydrants, you know, take ownership. I remember driving down the street, this was not our first new area, and I won't say whose it was, but I was just sort of driving down the street seeing this and going, I remember back days when I was a fire captain and we'd be driving down the street and it's like, hey, did you just see that hydrant? What are you talking about, Steve? That hydrant that's like buried in there? Oh, it's, you know, we'll find it in the middle of the night. Oh yeah, okay, we don't get snow on the ground like you guys get. We have blue dots in the center that signify where the hydrant's at. We don't get rain either, but sometimes the blue dots are missing, they're damaged, and I want to know where the hydrants have, so take ownership. You know, take ownership of your apparatus. LA County Fire posted this, someone with LA County posted this a couple of years ago. I remember posting this on Twitter. A lot of LA County engines, they take pride in their apparatus, with their, especially their hose beds, and it's almost like a competition amongst the crews. Well, I remember posting this, and, and I, I don't mean to be a troll sometimes, but it's entertaining on the internet. To, see responses, you know, I'm not so stupid as, you know, stupid to be naive, but when I look at something like this, I'm like, hey, you know what, I'll give credit to this crew that takes pride in their apparatus. I bet you I can open up probably all the compartments. I bet the tools are dialed in. I bet they're maintained. I bet the crews are trained. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, as I should. But on Twitter, there's a lot of people that are starting to, well, they must be a slow engine company that runs like one call every week. You know, they got nothing better to do than polish their engine. and. One of the members of this crew actually got on Twitter and said, no, actually, sir, we, you know, we run 10 to 15 calls a day. We probably see fire in South Central LA, Watts area. We see fire probably every day in some capacity. So we're dropping hose every day. We take pride in what we do. And then it was cool because there was people from posted pictures of FDNY rigs. I saw some Washington DC rigs. And I know it's not everywhere. And I know it doesn't mean a lot, but when you got to, shit. What's a new engine cost these days? Upwards of like 800000 give or take. Yeah, give or take. Let's take pride in what the taxpayers are fortunate to give us. But again, doesn't mean they're dialed in firefighters, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt if they can take ownership and pride there. Now, I saw some of these documents out on one of the, um, one of the desks out there. If you haven't seen this document, it's a free PDF on the internet. Just Google Healthy and Healthy Out. Washington Council of Firefighters put this together. We used this a few years ago to sit down with our labor group. Now, we know this is a hazardous job. Trust me. You play football, you're probably going to get a concussion at some point, and you may have serious brain damage. I get that if you play tackle football. Firefighting, it's a dangerous, risky job, of course. That's what we signed up to do. And we may come out of it with cancer. We may come out of it killing ourselves in the course of doing business. Those things happen hopefully for the right reasons. But the point is, if you're looking for suggestions, here's some good suggestions that we set down with our labor group, uh, just to, and again, we're not gonna be perfect, we're not, one of our members goes, we'll be, we need to um, prevent cancer. Okay, there's no way we're gonna prevent cancer. I mean, all of us in the world, human beings, I think are gonna get cancer if we live long enough, sad to say, no matter what line of work. But there's a lot of things we can do to help reduce exposure to stuff. You know, not just wearing our gear and so forth. Now. I love seeing pictures like this. It's not uncommon to see fire departments post pictures or uni maybe unions or associations or whatever organizations post pictures like that. 
a training bird, I get it, looks like. Well, you got one red hat, the company officer, with about seven other, give or take, firefighters. Okay. It's obvious the one that doesn't have the SCBA on, right? Here's the one, the one that doesn't is the person that's on the nozzle. Now here's the challenging part of, we all preach this brotherhood crap, which I'm all for brotherhood, but where's the brotherhood there? That ain't brotherhood. But then of course, what happens when that person steps behind? I mean, there's a company officer that's obviously not doing their job. If they're career, they're stealing money from the taxpayers. If they're volunteer, they're still not supporting their members. But why do you think, <coughs> again, we could speculate, but that person doesn't want to give up the nozzle. I get it. But where can this come back and bite us? Let's think bigger picture. I want also everyone to come away with it just thinking a little bit bigger picture. As a firefighter, you may go, that's a cool picture. What's the big deal? Where can that come back and bite that guy on that nozzle? Think three years out, five years out. If he gets sick. Now he gets sick. What, I don't know your workers' comp laws or benefits that you get from workers' comp, but I know in California with so many fraudulent claims, workers' comp pretty much denies, even though we have cancer presumptive benefits, workers' comp in California pretty much automatically just denies it pushing it back to the employee to prove that they actually wore their stuff, they were trained properly, and they didn't do stuff like this. Then they have investigators that search, obviously, the department website, the union or association website, and just the internet. Now, when you're dealing with whatever stage cancer at that point, I couldn't even imagine, knock on wood, having to deal with that, but you're not in a position to want to deal with stuff like that. Your family's not in that position. We have one of our retired captains God, he died, he had brain cancer, it was just miserable, and he died about seven years ago. From what I heard, his family's still dealing with workers' comp for his full presumptive benefits. And he wore his PPE, and I don't think there's any reasons why they shouldn't, but they're still fighting some of those battles, and it's frustrating, you know, that this is the type of stuff, and that's why, if, especially if you're a chief, if you have a PIO, most of us don't have dedicated PIOs, but if you have one person that's responsible for posting stuff on social media, Make sure you actually look at that stuff. Even your union page. I mean, you may have, if you have a union at all, I've had on occasion had to call up our union president or someone on the e-board to say, hey, you know what? That picture of the guys on the roof, yeah, it's a cool picture, chief. I know it's a cool bitchin' picture, but they're basically admiring their work after they cut the hole in the roof and nobody's got their SCBA on. Oh, shit, I didn't think about that. Yeah, let's probably not have that picture on there, you know, let's just, Try to stick to pictures with people wearing their gear. I know it's not a perfect world, but we got to do our best to look out for each other. And that's the whole concept of prompting for success. Because obviously the officer's not doing it here. So, And speaking of officer, the last thing you want to do is you don't want to have to make your boss do their job. When I say that do your job is you don't want to have to have someone hold you accountable. I think that should be all of our goal. Whether when we were kids, we don't want our parents to hold us accountable. but don't make your boss do their job. So in this situation, you know, we still see pictures like this. And, and I know when I'm around the country, it's very easy for people to point fingers. Well, that's, and, I, and I'm not picking on volunteers, but, oh, that's a volunteer. That's someone in a rural area, or that's someone, whatever. There's no excuse for stuff like this. You know, again, where's the brotherhood and the teamwork there of helping each other out? Just like, hey, dude, get your... Get your pants on. Well, it's hot out. I know it's hot out, but we got to wear our gear. Let's go for it. So for fire officers, and for those of you in the room, you got to be able to say no or knock it off. That's probably one of the biggest challenges that you have. If everyone did their job, like I talked about, number one, do your job, wouldn't being an officer be pretty easy? Yeah, it would be. But again, some people just maybe forget things. Some people are, I mean, it's the old, are they unwilling? Are they unable? Um, or... Was they unable, unwilling? This is the communication part of the class. Unable, unwilling. Unknowing? Probably so. Uneducated. Unknowing, uneducated. Thank you. And, and usually it's one or the other there, but you've got to be able to say no or knock it off. You know, got to have integrity, obviously. You know, what happens when you're thrust into that officer position? Whether you're appointed, promoted, elected, whatever it is, what happens when you're thrust into that officer position? besides the weight of the responsibility of those plungers on your collar brass. I mean, you got a lot more responsibility. But yeah, the goal is to try to get everyone to go home, but it's also to, that may not happen every time for the right reasons, but your goal is also not to let bad things happen to the public. 
you know, it's a very delicate balance. I talked about the health and wellness stuff, which is good. I think we've almost, before you say I'm unsafe or I don't care about safety or health and wellness, I do. But the pendulum has almost swung so far that with the health and wellness, which is good, but it's almost there's some that forgot why we're here. Why did we sign up? Why did we take that oath of office? I mean, to risk our lives, I mean, obviously to serve the community and give back, help others, but to occasionally risk our lives when we need to, hopefully for the right reasons. I mean, if the building is fully involved, which is usually pretty easy to manage at that point, surround and drown, but most of the time, I don't know about your experiences, I mean, if you've got a long response, it's, it's probably fully involved, but around here, it's usually never fully involved. So yeah, there's probably a good chance people are inside that building, and that's why we're here, because nobody else is coming. But as an officer, you've got to be able to be dependable, have your stuff together. You've got to know when to be the crew member and when to be the supervisor. That company officer that was overseeing the guy sucking in the smoke in that training burn, was he a crew member or a supervisor? He wasn't a supervisor, otherwise he would have said, hey, Ray, here, let's get your SCB on, Ray, or whoever. He was being a crew member. Now, same as buddy to boss, for any of you that are chief officers, let me know if you, if you agree or disagree with this comment. We have a buddy to boss problem, I think, going from firefighter to company officer. I think that's still alive and well. I've seen that we also have a buddy to boss problem going from company officer to chief officer. Shift commander I'm talking about for career departments. I see a lot, and it's all around the country, shift commanders that will probably never strong company officers, but then now they're a battalion chief or whatever you call the shift commander for a career department that don't want to be the bad person. Because now, instead of having maybe one or two people supervise, now they're in charge of multiple companies. They don't want to be the bad person. And it's like, no, I mean, it's, we're not, no one's asking you to be the bad person. Just do the right thing, and you know, if everyone did their job, be easy, but you've got to keep people in check. And then I talk, about, I talk about utilizing the headline test. One of our retired BCs put this together with me, and it's a lot of things to remember, but it's that old saying of, you know, nothing else, don't do anything that your mother or your parents would be ashamed of, you know, and if that's one way to remember things, that's great. But the headline test, as a company officer, are you going to get tested by your crews? For parents, do your kids test you? Test your boundaries. Test to see how far, you know, give an inch, take a mile, and all that other stuff. You know, I think that's that good resource that I've had to throw back sometimes, because when, hey, I want to take care of my personnel. I want to do what I can for them. But then there's, there's times where it's like, hey, as a captain, Steve, can we go to Pete's Coffee? Okay, I'm not a coffee drinker, I like my iced tea, but Pete's, there's no Pete's in our first two area. Well, it's over, it's on, you know, El Camino Real over there, which is the city of San Jose next to us. That ain't our first two area, that ain't our jurisdiction. Well, we can just go over there stealth. Well, stealth don't work anymore. Why does stealth not work anymore? I don't know what you're, what? GPS. Well, first of all, I don't know, how long they've been in rigs, but black boxes have been in rigs for at, probably at least 15 years, if not longer. So you got to realize there's GPS in the rigs. Also, when we're driving those big BRTs, big red trucks, we have white ones. I was going to make a white joke, but for red trucks with the billboards of the department name and everything else, it's pretty obvious. It's like, hey, what's a Butte fire engine now out here? Obviously, what's a Butte fire engine doing in Helena or Missoula, two hours away? Is stretching it, but in our area, all this. For anyone that's been to the Bay Area, everything, you don't even know the difference in the cities because they all blend together because there's so much people there. But everyone's always watching. Plus, everyone's got one of these these days, if not two of them, and looking out for us. So when that crew wanted to, hey, Steve, you said when you gave us expectations and your leader's intent, because we all should be doing that as officers, you said you'd take care of us. You'd get us what we need. Right. I did. I guess I forgot to say within ethical good reasoning or with integrity, and I, you know, I use this to sometimes throw it back of, no, we're not going to do that today, but here's why. Because is it the right thing for the department to go get coffee in another first two area? No, I don't see that. Is it right for our personnel, maybe those two on the rig, because they want their, they can't, God forbid they drink Starbucks or Safeway coffee or whatever else. But is it, but here's the thing, let's say we get in trouble because GPS catches us or there's a run in our first two area, real estate's uncovered, and now we've got a long response time or something else, and now we get in trouble for it. You think they're going to have my back as an officer because I took care of them? Remember, why do you never want to be the highest ranking person in the room when things go south? 
Where do the fingers point? What do you think that they're going to say? Well, you should have said no. Oh, yeah. Or you said it was okay. Yeah. So it is, and they're going to get in trouble probably too, just like I will be. But, you know, obviously things that may help us make an ethical decision. Thankfully, there's not a lot of ethical decisions on a daily basis, but sometimes there are. I always love the last one. If any of you are ever in charge of discipline, I mean, discipline, thankfully, was rare in our department. Most, 99% of the people do the right thing every now and then. Someone needs to get discipline. I get it. This is something I learned from a friend of mine is those occasional times as the admin chief when I had to discipline somebody, not a written counseling, but maybe suspension, even termination, or maybe um, transfer, significant stuff. They'd come in with their union rep and they'd plead their case and I'd share all the facts to them. Okay, here's, we're gonna do this. Here's the reasoning why we're recommending whatever suspension or whatever else. Here's the, here's everything that we had and obviously they have rights and everything else. And I usually ended it with, if you can tie in what you did to our mission statement, you can walk free right now. And most of the time people said, oh shit, that, you know, going, getting, getting coffee, I'll just use an example, getting coffee in our next new area in another city is, no, our, so maybe it's a good, good tool to use if necessary. All right, as we wind things down, knowing to be a leader and a follower, hey, there's a time and a place for both, obviously. You can't be a lead, you've got to be a leader of one yourself before you can be a leader of any. And there's a lot of people in leadership positions, like fire officer, all the way up to fire chief, that are leaders by definition, but maybe not by credibility and respect. As much as you may hate your boss, I mean, we never always love every one of our bosses, but you at least got to have their back, because if you want them to have your back, you better have their back and help them out and throw them bones, as tough as it is. You know, I love when people say, like, I don't want to drink the Kool-Aid. It's okay to drink the Kool-Aid if the Kool-Aid's good. I Meaning there is some good Kool-Aid out there doing the right thing for the right reasons and everything else. Here's a situation from Chicago. And you may go, God, I'm glad we work in a volunteer department. Well, that can happen too in volunteer organizations, but a veteran Chicago firefighter was fired. Apparently, apparently having his girlfriend come to the firehouse, his brothers and sisters looked away, happened multiple times up to a dozen other firefighters, some of whom retired because they were going to get disciplinary action, stand accused of basically not paying attention. So I get the brotherhood is alive and well, and we've got to trust each other, we've got to have our backs, but when someone puts you in a position and crosses the line, whether you're the boss, whether you're just an equal, or hell, it could be your captain and you're the firefighter, at some point you're going to be in that tough decision-making process where you may have to raise your hand, but here's the problem. Kitchen table, let's say, with 10 guys at the firehouse. You want to be the one that raises your hand and says, hey, Rick, dude, you got 20 days off a month. Can you keep it in the pants when you're on the job? Keep that to off-duty stuff because I don't want anyone coming by the firehouse and, you know, shooting up the place or whatever else. Everyone's probably thinking the same thing because everyone knows right from wrong, but nobody wants to be that person here because now you look like a snitch. And it's like, dude, well, what's the goal when you retire besides having hopefully a nice long retirement, healthy, you know, we already know we've got a divorce rate of about, what, 50 to 60% in the United States, public safety even higher. You know, how do you explain that to your significant other? Because I've seen stuff like this happen where it's like, well, I don't want to go against the brotherhood here. How do you explain that on the home front? Oh, honey, I got suspended for the month of June. Yeah, we can go to Florida for that vacation. I'm suspended without pay, though, so I'll, but I'll work overtime when I get back, so I'll make it all up. You think you what do you think your significant other's going to say to you? What happened? Well, you can tell your side of the story. 20 years ago, you can tell your side of the story. Why does that not jive today? When, when there's disciplinary action, this stuff makes the news. And then you get your significant other reading this stuff going, well, you told me this, and this, oh, don't believe that stuff that you read. That's just all a bunch of whatever. You think now you're going to have trust issues at home? So what's Ralph covering for you? Oh, Ralph, no, no, honey, you and I, circle of trust. We've got that going on, right? Yeah. So I get it's a tough situation. But here's the crappy thing. Usually it's us as the innocent ones are put in these positions to have to be that leader. And again, it might be the lowest ranked person in the room because the officer's not doing their job. It sucks. Touch on relationships a little bit. You know, building and maintaining effective relationships is critical. You know, especially when you're brand new. New to a position, new to an organization, or on the flip side, you got some got someone new to the organization. You know, get to know everybody all around you because especially, not just as an officer, but as a coworker, or a subordinate, you need to know the strengths and weaknesses of everybody, especially your bosses. You can help bail them out at times. 
like I said, I don't always agree with everything all my bosses did, but I also knew that I better cover their back if I expect them to have my back. So, talked about generations a little bit here. For those of you that are, that are still stuck on, well, these kids today, all they do is hand, you know, they're on their phones and technologies. Billy Goldfeder posted this meme a while ago, you know, all this technology is making us antisocial. Obviously, you can tell the date on this picture is everyone's wearing suits as they're in this train here, which doesn't happen today, but the technology is this stuff right now. 50 years ago, it was newspapers. What's it going to be 100 years from now? I don't know. And again, before you start pointing fingers, I love this picture, <laughs> everything goes full circle in life, right? And if you're that person, and I've been guilty of that too, if you're that person, you kids today or these kids today, guess what they're probably, those kids today are probably saying about you. You grumpy old man, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, everything goes full circle. So if you really want to build credibility and respect, especially as you get older, it's tough because if you don't have kids or grandkids, you're going to be working with people. And in obviously volunteer organizations, you may have, what, four to five generations of people. I mean, I've seen volunteers, 70, 80 years old, good for them. I mean, that's awesome. Then you also have people maybe 18 years old, 16 years old, depending on what you do. Talk about relationships here. I love this picture here, you know. We're type A personality firefighters, same with cops there, but I love this. Our fire station's next door to the police department, pranks and sue. If you don't know your local law enforcement, get invite them over to the firehouse. Start to get to know them before it's ODARC 30 and you're on the freeway and you're getting into a shouting match because they're telling you to you know, open up that lane or whatever else. Those things still happen, but hopefully you have that relationship long in advance. But another reason not to have pranks, you know, Hey, you get two type A personality work groups together, and now you add in social media. I mean, obviously now when this stuff gets posted, I mean, there are funny things to happen. You know, it says, shh, fireman sleeping. You know, but again, pranks can get out of control sometimes. So, just a few other things. Remember that leadership and teamwork starts at the firehouse. That is so true. Just a quick little video I want to share. And again, this stuff can happen. Like I talked about things out there. Macon, Bibb County, Georgia, outside of Atlanta, about an hour outside of there, they had a fire station prank a few years ago. They had a masked gunman that burst into the fire station with an apparent fire alarm. Fire army was shooting, he was, with sounds resembling gunshots, he was shooting blanks. Eight firefighters disciplined up to termination, including the captain, who was suspended 20 days. I don't know why the highest ranking person wasn't the one with the work, most discipline, but that's how they did it. The terminated firefighter state stunts like this are not unusual. He's seen at least three like this. Why? Because again, he doesn't want to get fired and he's backed up against a cliff and he wants to rat out his boss, which for all those times you think you want to help out your firefighters, they will rat you out if they're looking at their butt backed up against a cliff. But this little video um, you can find on YouTube, it, there's a rookie firefighter you're going to see in the middle of the picture here scared out of his wits because he doesn't realize that the gunman is a firefighter from another station. So they're just playing a prank on, hey, it's the rookie. Let's see if he you know, panics or craps in his pants. This is their video, so very professionally done. I mean, wait to the end. This is the rookie right here, you can tell he's terrified. common sense, someone got common sense and they yanked it down, but as we know today in the world, the internet, everything's up there. Well, this is a department that was looking at station closures. If you're the city council and you see stuff like this out there, 
guess what? We probably do need to close that firehouse. Just like I said, support your boss. You don't have to agree with the fire chief, but your fire chief hopefully is going to bat for all of you to at least keep stations open and not have them closed. Well, now you just took the bullets away from his gun. I like the term, give your boss bullets for their gun. Meaning, do the right thing so they can go to bat for you. They yanked it. What would a good company officer do at that point, the highest ranking person? If, if, if you realize it was bad enough and you yank it, what would hopefully a good ethical common sense officer do immediately? I know we're short on time here. I apologize for running over. Wouldn't have to have a conversation. First of all, it shouldn't have happened, but once they realize it happened, do Own what? It. Own it. Yeah. Own it. Phone a friend very quickly, meaning your boss. Boss, we screwed up big time. You need to come down here right now. What are you talking about? This is code three license cyber. I need you to come down here. I need to fall on the sword. Well, boss, in this case, life's about choices. Look at the boss. There's now a text string as part of the investigation between the company officer and her crew of them basically, are we in big trouble? Are we fired? Don't think so. I didn't know it was gonna happen last minute. That's the officer. I might get suspended. Basically, they're corroborating their story. I, you know, I, I love it. But it was recorded, so they knew it was happening. Yeah. Okay. So now this comes in, but they yanked it. They didn't tell anybody apparently until it leaked out. And then next thing you know, the fire chief's doing damage control. And then obviously the investigation makes it very easy because the firefighters are obviously ratting out their company officer, and then she's probably she's probably blaming them. Well, they put me up, to, which sorry, you're the highest ranking person in the room. But had they owned it right away, jobs probably would have been saved. Careers would have been saved. Families would have been saved. But instead, we get groupthink at the kitchen table sometimes. And before you say, well, God, I'm glad I'm volunteer. We don't have, we just have drills. We don't have crews. This stuff can happen anywhere in a department facility. And I think that's the challenging part. But as an officer, these are types of scenarios that you got to be the one that raises your hand and says, you know what, hey, we ain't doing that. Well, come on, you don't let us have fun anymore. All that weight of the badge has gone to your head. Well, okay, call it what you want. Let's go back to the headline test. Right for the department, right for the community personnel. I'm actually keeping you all employed for, since they were all full time. So, last two, have compassion and provide courtesy and service. That was our model and our patches that we try to take seriously. You know, as I talk about ownership and pride, hey, you know what? Especially for career departments that run a lot of calls and have a lot of frequent flyers, it can get very old sometimes and very jaded. Oh, we're going out to this house again, or we're going out there, this alarm sounding again, or we're going out here again, homeless in camp and whatever it is. Hey, you know what? It's still the best gig in the world. Whether you're volunteer, whether you're paid, or whatever else. And it's easy for us to forget that stuff in today's world. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves and remind others that, you know what, the customer is not an inconvenience. You know, obviously, last but not least, lead by example. Now, I get shorts are appropriate in certain parts of the country, but chiefs, and you may disagree with me on this, and, I, and I'm totally good with that one, but our expectations when I was the operations chief was that, you know what, if you're a white hat chief going to the scene, dress as you would expect your firefighters to dress. You know, if they have to do in 100 degree weather or whatever, they have to wear their full gear, you wear your full gear. You know, I mean, usually a chief is not going inside unless we have multiple chiefs and we may have some station inside, but at least walk the walk, talk the talk. You know, you look at some other pictures, we always talk about, it's about them, it's about them. It is about them, the public, the customers, that's why we're here. <laughs> if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. But what about us? We gotta do our part too. And stuff like this, like I shared, gets circulated on the internet, it was just like, I've never seen that before. Usually I've seen the SCBA without the mask, but I've never seen the mask without a bottle. But again, I, I don't know, or stuff like this. And this was out in the New Jersey, and one of my friends out there says, as ah, one of the volunteer departments out there and everything else, hey, at least he's got his SCBA on, his respiratory is protected and everything else. But again, in closing, we don't get a second chance to make a great first impression, again. Most people never call 911 in their life. And when we do show up, whether it's an emergency, a non-emergency, or whether it's at the firehouse, someone knocks on the door, or runs into your crew doing a public, ed public education or public relations event, we don't get that second chance to make you know, that first impression. So someone's always out there watching and ready to call us, especially in today's world. So in closing, feel free to reach out if I can ever be of assistance for you. Um, connect on social media, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. 
Uh, my YouTube channel has a couple hundred videos on helping people get hired, get promoted. And you may say, well, I don't worry about getting promoted because I don't want to be promoted. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of good leadership tip, tips out of there as well, too. But thank you all for the gift of your time. We ran over a little bit, so enjoy the rest of the conference. Hopefully our pass across either tomorrow morning or somewhere else. I'm a resource, and have a good day, everybody. Thank you.